Uh, right. Welcome to Reality Check. Uh, my guest today is Kevin Alster, and Kevin is the lead of the Syntasia, Syntasia Academy. Kevin, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what brought you uh, to this time in life? Sure. So, um, like you said, Ilya, I head up Synthesia Academy, which is our customer education arm. Uh, my mission really is to help enterprise close the gap between processing information when we look up a, a, a solution to a problem and putting it to work. And I want to do that using AI video communications. Uh, before Synthesia, I was working more in branded learning, working at the School of the New York Times and Sotheby's, helping them uh, put together learning products using the expertise that they have at those uh, at those wonderful companies, as well as corporate reskilling and upskilling programs around data and program management. So a little bit more in corporate L&D. And what brought me here today, or brought me to Synthesia, was a chance meeting with the founders here in Copenhagen. Uh, they were uh, looking for somebody who had an L&D background and some uh, video production experience as well. And I happened to fit both those bills. And two and a half years later, here I am. So you say Synthesia. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'll correct my pronunciation of the company name. So, you know, every time I look at the people that are working on um, different types of digital avatars, uh, I start, start scratching the surface and I immediately hear Synthesia uh, mm -hmm. as the foundation for all that. So how the guys came up with the idea of Synthesia, where the company came from? So what's the uh, origin of the idea and how long the company was in the market? For sure. So I, I certainly can't take uh, take credit for any of the amazing tech that the research and the development and everything that goes into the product has uh, has gotten to, to where it's gotten to today. But what I, um, you know, working with the founders, we know that, you know, much in the early days back in 2017, when the company was first founded, it was really focused on this idea of uh, AI dubbing. So if you were to watch a film that has been translated into um, another language, there's, I, you know, growing up in America, I often think of old Kung Fu movies where the mouth lip sync is not even matching. And so where it started out was using computer vision to uh, match what is being uh, spoken with the audio, matching that up with a lip sync. And so when the company was first started, it was really focused just uh, in uh, on the mouth area. And for those who can't see what I'm doing, I'm just taking my hands and really focusing it just on the under nose and mouth and in the lips area. And that's where it started. But then in around 2020, that's uh, when the the uh, the tech actually found its home as a product, which is actually as a Chrome based video editor. So rather than using your camera and, and your microphone, you could actually use these AI avatars, you could give them a script um, using text to video and text to audio, uh, just by typing in a script and then hitting a button and then you get your talking head video. So that's when this tech actually became a product once there was a video editor that was uh, that was created. And that's kind of where we are today. We have these digital avatars, which are the foundational tech of how, um, how we bring text into video. And then there's also everything on the back, on the product side that makes that happen, which is the video editor in a browser. You know, uh, this is speaking of being uh, in the right place at the right time, uh, it's amazing that all the foundation tech had been uh, worked on right in time for the uh, chat GPT and Gen AI coming to life. So yes. now you basically become the digital embodiment uh, of uh, the uh, generative AI. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think that's that's an important distinction. What you're what you're bringing up there is that Synthesia's tech really focuses on the video. I think there's so much talk about, um, you know, with the with the advent of ChatGPT and large language models and this ability to use natural language processing to communicate with uh, information and technology. I think that's a, a huge uh, step forward for everyone. But I, I think in particular where Synthesia's focus is on the realistic portrayal of human actors. So there is this. Uh, emphasis on the digital representation of that information and, and the digital representation of human performance. And often I think it's important to distinguish between 
these two big things that have happened is both are generative AI and that it's coming up with um, with content that hasn't existed before. It's, it's coming up with brand new content. It's not necessarily just uh, regenerating something based off of patterns, but it's com coming up with something completely new. And in our case, in one case here, it's the uh, text-based information. In the other case here, it's uh, the video uh, representation and this human model that we have that can create videos that didn't exist before. So uh, it's it's exciting because there's so much that's being done in, in this space with the information, but there's not as many players yet in the space of how do we uh, have a human representation for this information or how do we have a digital embodiment of, of uh, that information and the performance. So it's an exciting place to be. So uh, every time I start talking about the digital avatars, uh, the concept of the uncanny valley comes in. And uh, uh, to be honest, I was recently pleasantly surprised. I, I, I heard uh, a digital annotation of the book. And that was read in a really um, uh, good way. So the intonations were completely human. So it was almost impossible to distinguish between like real human reading this book and uh, uh, the AI doing this work. Uh, at the same time, when it comes to uh, digital avatars, the video, uh, uh, there is something spooky um, uh, about these avatars. So when do you think we'll come to the point where it will be, uh, will be out of this valley? Yeah, it, it's, it always comes up when we talk about digital avatars, because I think it's, it's impossible to avoid the fact that replicating a complete human performance is that's always going to be the next step or the next frontier, the next challenge. And I think there are two things to consider is what is the state of the technology now? Um, I know that when I first started at Synthesia it was really focused on the mouth. And in the past two and a half years, we've expanded to the rest of the face. What are the eyes doing? The fact that you're blinking, but you know, an avatar doesn't need to blink. So how do you program that in uh, so that it looks natural? Or something that I often like to tell folks about who mentioned the Uncanny Valley is, you have an avatar who doesn't need to breathe. We need to breathe, take a breath in between my shoulders. Right now you can't see them, but they're rising and falling. My, there's parts of my chest that are rising and falling. That's something that one, you have to notice. You, and it's, it's one of those things where you notice about human performance, it's so complex. There's so many small moving parts that our brain is saying, this is what makes up a human who's just speaking on camera. And so going from version one to version two uh, was this idea of, uh, full frame synthesis you know just because you have the body that's on there the chest should be moving there should be some sway with the shoulders because humans get uncomfortable when they sit for too long and talk for too long and then you know what the eyebrows are doing and now that i'm saying this on video i'm i'm very self-conscious about my eyebrows but <laughs> if they go up too much that's uncanny valley if they go they don't go up enough that's uncanny valley and so um it's all the complexities of of First of all, noticing, but then tagging and and uh, and then animating a human performance that's important. I think the other other thing that's important to notice is that it all depends on where these AI avatars appear. If we use them as we use human actors today, of course you're going to notice that an avatar's performance is a little bit different. For example, if you have any sort of content or context that requires a lot of emotion or a lot of expression, that's when you're going to notice that an AI avatar is not matching up to what you would expect from a human performance. But let's say you were serving up something like an airline safety video, and I, this is one of my favorite examples, AI avatars are perfect for that, because I don't need a human being to show me, to, to tell me where the exits are, if you could show it on a diagram, but I can have, it's just instructional and informational content that the AI avatar is perfectly normal for delivering that type of content. So I think that context and content matters as much as acknowledging the complexity of human performance. But I guess the average person, you know, at the end of the day, they don't really care about that. They just want to see the, the, the avatars replace a human or not. I wonder, uh, in my manufacturing world, um, there's a lot of discussions about the digital twin which is mm -hmm. to some degree a physical model of um, the machine or process or something like that. So 
Is there a discussion within your realm about the digital twin of the human uh, body, like mechanical, how it mechanically works? Yeah, do you, when you say mechanically works, do you mean? Well, you mentioned all this micro movements, there yes. are different muscles, there are chest movement, the breathing, the, yes. uh, the being able to, uh, being tired of sitting still. Um, so all, all that, uh, how it, the body is composed. Uh, just to give you an example, when really good painters uh, paint a human body, they actually start with painting the skeleton, then they paint the muscles, and then they paint the skin, then they paint the clothes, and then you have like a very natu natural um, uh, image. So do you start with the muscle, um, the skeleton muscle, uh, and the mechanics of the human body? This is a really complex question that I, I, I don't have the expertise to answer because when you look at what's going on on the computer screens of our research and development team, you see that there are people who are working just on ears. There are people who are working <laughs> just on eyes. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's somebody's job to master these small, really specific parts of, of even just the face. And then it's somebody's job to then put it back all together. And so uh, I can't speak to how um, kind of the, the layers of, of, of mastery of, of, of the human performance in the movement. What I will say is that uh, where the tech is now, it's really focused on the delivery of getting the realism of the face. And of course, a lot of our framings you'll notice in the product are uh, from the waist up and the shoulders to that. So it's about from just above your belly button to the top of your head. But what we're doing now in what we research is we uh, at our studios in London, we have a fully 360, 360 degree volumetric capture rig. So imagine a giant cage and imagine a um, a bunch of cameras placed all around. And with those cameras, you need lights because you don't want to have shadows anywhere on the body and the face. And we have a 360 degree treadmill. And what it does is it's just capturing the body doing different things because right now what we're doing is we're just capturing data this data doesn't exist in a form that is necessary to replicate all of human performance i think we're really good at volumetric capture meaning uh putting uh mocap like putting little uh the the suits with little white balls all over them and, and we're able to map that onto another performance but when you are talking about generating a full-bodied human performance we need to capture that data first. So that's what we're working on. Because once we have that data, a few years down the road, we'll be able to synthesize the whole human performance walking around a, a, a 360, a, three, a 3D space and being able to motion to different things. Because um, ultimately this is all heading towards Hollywood's video in a browser. You should be able to recreate the entire uh, performance of a human, but using generative AI. Perfect. That, that, that's actually a great segue. Um, so now we talked about the digital avatars and uh, what brought you to this point. So how do you create the digital avatar? Can you show me? Can you do the demo? So if I want to have an avatar of myself or somebody wants uh, to have their own avatar, how, what, what do they need to do? What does it take to make a premium AI avatar? I'm talking about the tech behind making a fully AI generated human like David Beckham or Lionel Messi, or even just my own AI avatar speaking on the Danish national news, even though I don't speak Danish. I traveled all the way to our London Whopping Press studios, where I'll show you all the humans behind the process and the tech behind making those AI avatars and bringing them to life and how to do it best. So let's get to it. Yeah, I'm a producer here at Synthesia, which means I do all the scheduling and the casting mm. and I'll be directing you. I do a lot of things, to be honest. At the moment, I do many, many things, but it's really, really fun and we love it. Oh, nice question. Being on, as in very much like on with your smile, focused on the camera and they're keeping a smile, but also being chill because we can keep doing takes until you get there. Keep doing the takes until we get there. Yeah. How many takes do you reckon you're going to be doing? Like a, a thousand. A thousand yeah. takes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
I'm Megan and I do the hair and makeup. I prep all of the people that come here and get their fur makeup. Mostly for the guys is to just trust the process. Like you're not gonna look like you have a lot of makeup on. Yeah. We wanna get rid of the shine so that when we're in the green skin, we don't get any green reflecting off us. And you don't look as sweaty or as oily. It doesn't necessarily make you oily or sweaty, it just highlights the oil and the sweat way more than just if you were just walking around on a day to day. Mm. Cool, I'm ready to go. You're yeah. ready to go. Let's Amazing. go. All right. It's a huge hype up and you feel like a celebrity getting this much care and attention and hair, makeup and wardrobe. Now I'm heading up to one of the production rooms where the visual capture starts. Yeah, my name is Adam. I'm DPing, uh, so I'm mainly working with the camera and the lighting in the upstairs studio at the moment, where we ensure that the avatars look as good as they can. Framing the lighting and ensuring we're not only doing that, but we're also covering the technical specs. I think one of the best things that we tell people beforehand is that the words don't actually matter. The technology just needs the emotion to come through. Obviously the words take you to that emotional state, but they're not as important. So if you kind of stumble on the word, you can just keep going. At this point, I was really fired up to get in front of the camera. Whenever I'm on set, I want to entertain everyone around me. So I had to get some of this energy out. <laughs> so I can focus on nailing my performance. For this next part, I'll be reading a script from a teleprompter that's part of the training data to capture my face and body as I read. In a compelling journey, delving into the splendors and mysteries of our solar system, we touch the untouchable, a universe far beyond our reach, populated with celestial bodies, planets, asteroids, and cosmic rays. Our limitless curiosities grapple with principles of physics and geology. It took about 25 minutes and six takes of reading, three different types of scripts. I was also advised that you should really shine when you speak because the camera eats up some of your energy. Harness the sun and light up our lives. Cut, that was beautiful, right, cool. After the shoot, I was invited into a dungeon way in the back of the studio. This is where you go to clone your voice so that your AI avatar has a voice that matches its delivery. I'm Ricardo and I am sound recordist. I record voiceovers in this room. And this room is a bit odd. Can you tell me a little bit about what we're all looking at? This is just like a, a booth. Doesn't have much reverb, so we have a bit more of a controlled space to have a clean recording. Got it. Sometimes people see a microphone in front of them and they start panicking. If there was no microphone, it would be as easy as reading something out loud at home. There's not much of a difference. People tend to think they need to read quickly, but when you're recording like this, it's easier to, to read it slow and have a better performance pitch. Mm. At this point, we've captured all the audio and visual footage in the studio. Now we get to continue to visit the people in our London office to tell us what happens to the footage we just sent through. I'm Emily and I'm a part of the Avatar processing team. So think sure. I work on the post-production side where we run the avatars through the training and we also do a little bit of post-work on our stocks and we run a lot of different client avatars. When I told a friend what I did, she was like, oh, you're kind of like a bit of a director because you're choosing what looks good in the avatar, whether it be like colours or performance. Sometimes there are things in the performance that can be a bit difficult for us to make a good avatar. So really have a look at our guidelines and pay attention to the performance side of things, like how to actually be in front of the camera. Sure. Yes, I'm Pedro. Uh, I'm part of the video team. We are working on making strong models so that we can have the motion of our avatars as realistic as possible. The movements that you record on the studio on that day, those are the ones that are translated in a natural flow and we make an avatar that will essentially move in the same way that you do. So I was dancing yesterday and that was recorded Will that make it to my avatar? <laughs> that will be an interesting challenge. We don't have dancing avatars yet. The more you move, the more expression you put into the recording, the more you take out of the, of the generation of the avatar. This is great. Uh, I really uh, impressed with the 
progress that you've made so far with the uh, creation of the avatars. The, the, that's, that's much more realistic. Uh, thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Uh, so with that, uh, let me ask you this. So how do you see people actually using these avatars? That's my first question. And the second is, do you understand correctly that you can actually do uh, different languages as well? So you can speak uh, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, or Italian uh, with ease uh, using the avatar. Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first because it's a quick one. Yes, we support over 150 languages. What's uh, great is once you create your video, video translation is literally two clicks. You select the video, you click translate, and I guess there's one more click there where you select the language. And so we support uh, all those languages. And what it looks like is it, it's the same human avatar that you have, whether that's yourself or one of our stock avatars, but it's speaking in any one of those languages and uh, the lip sync matches up. The tone might be slightly different depending on what language you're speaking. For example, uh, there's, two, there's a, a few versions of Japanese where there's the polite version or there's, I think, the uh, more casual version. Uh, and, and so the, there will be slight differences in the voice, but otherwise, yeah, it's a, a two-click translation. Um, in terms of what people are using the, uh, the avatars for, um, I think I want to uh, rephrase my answer a little bit to answer what are folks using the video for, because the avatars themselves don't really appear on their own, but they appear within a video format. So uh, the, the, what people are, are mostly using it for are, at the moment, are training videos. So there's a lot of different types of instructional and informational content that's used a lot by learning and development. Uh, by IT, by sales enablement, by customer service, um, and just general large-scale uh, enterprise video creation. And so the reason that uh, a, a lot of customers are using us for instructional and informational content is because this is content that needs to be created uh, at, in most ways at scale, meaning you have some sort of training you're try, trying to deliver. Some of that training content is best decided that it should be delivered through video. And uh, you, rather than the person having to be on camera and having to record something with a microphone themselves, now they just type in the script, they hit generate video, and now they have, uh, now they have a video with a talking head on it. So um, those departments uh, within the company are the ones that have the most need for creating this type of quick video content. So in LMD, it could be anything from instructional videos to micro learning. With customer service, it can be, um, uh, with customer service, it can look something like uh, creating knowledge-based videos for uh, to, to help customers figure out their own uh, solutions for their questions. For sales enablement, it can be training or it can be sending customers uh, certain videos. And of course, when we talk about AI video, you're talking about the ability to translate this into multiple languages or the ability to uh, update this content very quickly. So there's a lot of, of use that we're seeing there. Uh, I think at this stage, we're still seeing a lot of internal use because the tech is so new and companies are still trying to figure out what to do about it. I think the most prominent use case that I've seen from uh, as far as uh, a customer facing solution is really around uh, this idea of uh, is in customer service with knowledge based videos. We're seeing a lot of companies who are, um, you know, they have these text based knowledge based articles. Uh, to help people answer frequently and ask questions. But now it's not replacing that text, but uh, providing a video uh, explanation that goes with that, which I think is important because now we're giving customers a choice whether they want to read text, which some folks prefer, or they want to watch it in a video and have it, th that process visualized for them. So a lot of folks in customer service are, are using that. We also see avatars being used a lot for uh, small teams who are engaged in some sort of marketing where, again, you have a four or five person team who doesn't want to be on camera or they have a need to produce lots of videos, they can use AI avatars to, uh, or a, a custom avatar or, or one of the stock avatars to, um, to send out uh, product updates or these small announcements. Again, it's this idea where you'd have video that needs to be sent out quickly and updated easily. Uh, that's really a good fit for external use cases. Yeah, let me give you an example. Uh, 
I've been talking to the manufacturing customer. They make the fairly complex machines uh, for production. And uh, of course, they train people that operate these machines. Um, but the problem becomes that after the training, people forget things. Yes. And when they forget things, that's one part of the problem. The bigger part, they, they are afraid to ask questions because they yes. are afraid to look incompetent. So uh, it would be much better to have a digital avatar. They can ask questions about the specific operation of this machine or de dealing with the problems uh, that they face uh, rather than asking the human being. So do you see the use cases like that? And is it possible uh, to, how difficult it is to basically combine the Gen AI model, uh, the LLM model, that will use the manuals of the machine with the um, uh, avatar, with the, the video avatar. For sure, the, we're we're talking about the the future of of communication with digital avatars, which I'm you know I'm I'm incredibly excited about. So, it, to answer your question, let's look at what the technology can do now. Uh, I think with large language models, what we've been able to see is that. Um, a person can communicate with information in a new way that they haven't been able to before, meaning the old way is search and retrieval. I have a question, I type in my, uh, my, uh, my query using semantic search, I pull something that is related to uh, a resource that's been created probably by another human that's related to that question I'm trying to answer. What we're seeing now is, and if you have Notion, uh, the Notion app, or uh, a lot of larger companies are using large language models internally, you can ask a completely open-ended question or ask a question about the task you're trying to solve. And using a large language model, it will generate a solution based off of the collective information that's within a company or a knowledge base. So already we're starting to see that with text, you can already communicate or dialogue with information to, to this use case that we're speaking about. Now, when it comes to using digital avatars, uh, I think this is where we I get excited because we get into an even more human um, human communication and conversation with information, because I think even typing me typing in is already me having to think about what are the words that I want to use rather than this free thinking and problem solving discussion that we're having uh, to, to get to a better outcome. And the, the big obstacle there is uh, having avatars being able to be generated in real time um, based off of the information that is being spoken by, by, the, by the knowledge base. So by that, I mean, if we look at this at a high level, what happens is I ask uh, the information my question, maybe using my voice or typing it in. It has a, you know, a few microseconds to think, start to generate an answer, and then it also has to generate a human model uh, that is going to voice, uh, you know, create a, a voice and create a visual representation of that response. So it feels like I'm communicating with another, uh, human or another person and that is a technological gap that is still being solved at this moment with the current uh with the current technology so i'm getting a little bit ahead of myself but uh, what i'm uh, what i'm saying is that it takes time to generate uh the human model because there's so much information that has to be understood and so once we're able to really close that gap and really have um, real-time generation of ai avatars then we can start to unlock that use case of what is the digital representation of the machinery manual or when machines have their own digital avatar that will then be communicating with or, or talking to as we're trying to get work done. That's uh, the future that I'm excited about. Okay, so basically you can um, have the movie experience, but not yet the live interaction experience. Uh, we're not there yet. Is, is that correct understanding? Uh, I think in terms of having a customer facing product, not yet. It's something that we're able to do. Um, it, it's something that that we're able to do locally, um, but it's not something that is. Uh, it, it, it's still uh, we're, we're we're still working on crossing that threshold of you know having uh, having a conversation with the cadence and the speed that you and I are having now, where it's one after the other. I think that with the current state of the tech, the the closest analogy that comes to mind is it's very much like a. Um, when you have a foreign correspondent reporting 
uh, on TV where I might say something to you, uh, you pause as it's coming in a couple seconds delayed or thinking, and then you start to respond a few seconds later. It's not even a problem that we have really solved even with live video in this day and age because there's so much information flying back and forth. So we're, again, our generation times are getting closer and closer to real time. And once we have uh, crossed that threshold in a way that's repeatable and scalable, then we'll start to be able to really converse with human, uh, human looking avatars. It will be interesting to do some calculations, what kind of uh, um, com compute resources needed on the edge in order to be able to have this uh, live conversation with uh, probably around 100 millisecond delay. Uh, that's more like human interaction uh, experience. Exactly. Exactly, because if, if it's too, uh, you know, I, I believe you were telling me a story about this before we had this conversation where uh, when you're looking for a response time, if it's too fast for a human, it's strange. If it's too slow for a human, it's strange. You want uh, that information processed uh, it, within a range, and it has to be fast. In yeah. Order to be uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, one of my past projects was uh, we were building the uh, light controller. And my goal that I set to the development team was uh, 50 millisecond uh, delay uh, between the motion of the finger and the response of the light. Mm -hmm. Because with that, you have a feeling that you actually, with your finger, create the direct action. Anything beyond 50 milliseconds, it becomes, uh, uh, it creates the feeling of the lag. And uh, if the light is not following the finger, then uh, th this is not pleasant. Uh, I think yes. uh, in human interaction, it's even more complex than this just lag. Uh, uh, it, it's basically your... Um, I have a long sentence. Yes. And in the middle of a sentence, you start responding, uh, nonverbal response, given nonverbal response, even though I'm mid-sentence. So having that, uh, like uh, now you look more uh, attentive uh, because I'm talking about something. I'm delivering slowly my message. And it would be uh, great to be able to respond uh, mid-sentence before the, set, the whole uh, idea is processed. Exactly. It, you know, you, you bring up this, this wonderful point of that, that I think captures humans' relationship to how we make sense of the world and how technology works. Even with just the light switch, I have to be able to sense that when I flip it, the light will not turn on until I finished flipping the switch because in my non-electrical engineering brain, I have to feel like I have something to do with the light that turned yeah. on. And any faster, I, my brain will think that something doesn't work because I, you know, it's not something I can touch and feel. And it's the same with, these AI, with uh, mimicking the human performance, where there are expectations that might be even slower than the fastest thing possible, but we have to match those expectations so that we don't have this sense that something's off or something strange and so i love that example of the light switch as a way to map to that's a you know very sim that's a, a i'm gonna say simple i don't even know how it's done but it's a very um uh it's one motion and then you think of the complexity of all the human motions and being able to understand what's my input in a conversation and what do i expect back it's not just that. Uh, it's um, the light switch has to respond to your intent of turning the light on. Uh, you move close and it has a proximity sensor and it uh, lights up near the, lights, uh, uh, the light switch. So uh, I'm waiting for you to do something with me. So please do. And then you flip the, uh, the light and it turns on. Yes. So um, the like. Understanding the even intent uh, can be an interesting uh, conversation by itself. Uh, and uh, um, speaking about the use cases for the uh, digital avatars, I, we, we all deal with lots of technologies every day, uh, and these are in different areas. But my favorite area is when it comes to the cars. I am super uh, surprised that in this day and age, we have to deal with this cryptic uh, uh, light indicators, uh, different uh, cryptic messages like blinking something. Uh, something is blinking on my dashboard. So what does it mean? 
And for some strange reason, I have to open my manual, uh, which is printed on real paper and um, read through pages and pages of uh, the documentation about this particular uh, car. Uh, why not have the digital av avatar? So have a digital mechanic with you all the time that can tell you what's going on uh, and answer your questions. Yeah, hey, I, I mean, th this is this is interesting because, or you know, you're no longer going to have to be alone to troubleshoot. There will always be somebody on hand who's infinitely patient, probably has some information and data on what you, your expertise level is and how it should ad adjust its messaging. Because I think in the use case that you're mentioning, when you open up an instructional manual, even thinking about if something goes wrong in my car, it could be written in what I picture the technical writing saying, oh, this light comes on, it means this is happening with the engine. When in reality, I saw the light come on, my emotions are high. I look at this thing and I just see a wall of text and it's not at all what I want to interact with. But if I'm able to have a, a digital avatar to not only have a conversation with, but it can also serve as the filter for helping me to analyze what is the information that's being told back to me uh, in a way that I can understand and, and, and act upon. Um, I, I'm not sure if what, you know, what I'm saying, it totally clicks there but for you, but uh, it's this idea that the avatar is sitting in a, a sort of a, a layer in between uh, me, the human, and uh, the, the software problem or the engine problem that's happening in front of me to be able to actually be in a place where I can figure out what's wrong and what to do next. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, and it will be interesting to uh, have access to all the knowledge bases, not only of the manual, but the um, uh, technical uh, questions that um, had been this, at the service uh, desk and the answers uh, that are available to this um, customer questions. Very much so. So yeah. all the troubleshooting. So now uh, with that, I have a couple of more questions for you. One is, okay, so I want to create a, an avatar. How much does it cost? Is it expensive? Um, how long does it take? Um, so um, uh, we talked about the process, but it will be interesting to understand the uh, financial side. For sure. So uh, if you are an individual uh, creator, you can uh, create a... Um, a webcam avatar uh, with the cost of an annual uh, subscription. So right uh, at the time of recording this, there is a starter price that is, uh, I think, $22 per month. And that equals uh, 360 minutes of AI generated video. And to create the webcam avatar, if you, if you purchase the annual pass or so whatever, sorry, 22 times 12, uh, 200, uh, 24, sorry, I don't, my, my math brain is, is just not on right now. But if you buy the annual pass, you're able to create the webcam avatar as part of the, uh, of the product because we want people to have this experience of what is it like to be an AI avatar because the tech is so new. Where would people use this? You know, what is it that experience like for you to see yourself uh, saying things that you had typed in, but not, not necessarily uh, recorded or spoken yourself. And then if we're talking about at the uh, enterprise level, uh, when you have an annual subscription, it costs uh, about $1,000 per year to host it. It costs, we'll, we'll help you process that information, whether you are uh, to make yourself into an avatar, whether that's you filming at home with a, a, a 4K camera uh, against a green screen, or you coming into the studio uh, as an enterprise customer uh, to get your avatar made. The $1,000 a year is the hosting and the security, uh, ma mainly the hosting and the security of the um, of the avatar. Because once you can, if you can imagine, once you have an AI clone of yourself, you want to make sure that no one else has access to it or you can approve what videos actually get created so that you're not generating content that you yourself didn't approve. So that $1,000 per year goes into hosting and security. Great. So uh, one more question, how do your customers respond uh, to the technology that you provide to them? Um, mm -hmm. So what, what people say when they see the capabilities of Syntasia? I think, so what they say, I think depends on what, the, what is the use case that they needed it for. So when, I, when you asked earlier, kind of what are customers using these AI avatars and generative AI video for, a lot of it is in training and development. And what they're doing is they are taking 
um, existing content and they're recreating it or uh, reimagining it with AI video. And that going from that process of I was doing recordings over and over with my uh, camera and with my voice and editing it myself, now going into an AI space, they are saving so much time on on even just editing and production and not having to be on camera. So there's that initial enthusiasm of, hey, I can create something uh, in a fraction of the time. There's also, of course, the huge cost saving measures of switching from traditional video creation into uh, AI video in that if you need to fix something or make a mistake, you don't have to go all the way to to get your camera out or your um, your microphone out and re-record something. So there's a lot of just efficiency and cost saving enthusiasm when moving into AI video. The uh, as far as the performance of the avatars, they are uh, again it always depends on what is the content and what is the context for these videos. But uh, by and large, a lot of folks who are viewing not creating the AI videos but viewing them they just assume it's another person on the team or if they notice something uh you know as the tech has gotten better they're just watching the video as as it were you know as, as if it were made with a, a real person i think you know when you try to inject they, they might we sometimes i might uh, get somebody who writes to me that says like hey i told this joke the joke uh didn't land so well and then you look at the joke in this corporate training video and it's the equivalent of a knock knock joke so you're like okay the avatars aren't meant to be used for that but as far as uh, having a talking head on camera it's the ability to get that professional looking a uh, high quality look with a fraction of the time so those who are creating videos are very enthusiastic about it um, one more uh, question. So what should we expect? What's what's the future for digital avatars? How do you see us uh, developing this technology uh, going forward? For sure. Um, in terms of developing the technology, I think you'll just see more expression, more of the human body, um, better voice, uh, being able to walk around in 360 spaces, uh, three three dimensional spaces I had uh, spoken about before. But I think where you see these digital avatars as the tech grows is a couple things. One, I think it's going to help us make sense of this really hyper personalized future. So I want you to think about all the places where you might really need to tailor a message to make someone feel seen or help them notice something or something that's important, because we're already collecting lots of data on people. And we already live in a world where apps make recommendations, but how can you humanize this or how can you uh, make somebody feel seen or listened to? And uh, one core example for me was recently I was on a British Airways flight where you have the TVs that are in the back of each person's headrest. And when you sit down as a customer, you sit in your seat, you see that you can have it in English, German, Japanese, Spanish, maybe five different op options. And then you have um, someone who looks like a representative of British Airways. But that's an area where we can get hyper-personalized, meaning we have the information when you made the purchase about your name, your preferred language, your country of origin, maybe make some uh, recommendations about who you'd prefer to see an airline safety video. And then when each person sits down and watches the TV in front of them, they're watching it in their own language that they prefer. The video is addressed to them in their name. Uh, maybe it's able to make recommendations based off of the meal preference, or it's about to queue up and kind of guide you more along through this airline experience rather than you just sitting in your screen waiting for captain announcements to come on. So it's uh, this idea of a hyper-personalized future that um, is exciting for some and scary for others. And I think uh, also with the future of avatars, I think there is uh, this idea of uh, digital companions that all's uh, I find uh, very, uh, ho I, I, that gets me very hopeful for both our oldest and youngest members of the population. I think when we talk about the youngest members of the population, they'll have grown up, uh, this generation alpha will grow up in a, a time where there are already AI avatars. There's avatars of Queen Latifah, avatars of Lionel Messi. They know that Lionel Messi probably doesn't speak Japanese, but it's just an expectation that there's an AI guide to uh, help them, uh, help tutor them or help them make sense of the world. And then for the oldest members, I think AI avatars serve as a human companion more for company 
or to help them remember things or to help them live their life in a more human way, meaning you don't have, uh, you, you'll have someone who you can communicate with that never loses patience and always tries to understand what this person is trying to get done. So I think those are two ways that we're gonna see digital avatars play a big role in, in the future to come. Yeah, I'm huge, huge supporter of these ideas. Uh, I'm actually, for the last three years, I'm thinking and developing the idea of the digital companion for the seniors. And I think this is like extremely, extremely important for our future because loneliness in senior citizens uh, is a big um, uh, health risk, uh, not just a problem, but uh, a health, real health threat. So um, building the avatars that will serve as the companions for them uh, but that brings us back to the problem that has to be solved, uh, where uh, real-time communication uh, mm. uh, is not there yet. Yes. Um, and uh, in, in another, uh, another adjacent question uh, I have. So um, now I can transpond my avatar to digital avatar. So, yes. or, or myself and my persona into digital avatar. Yes. Can I do the same transformation to become a pet? Uh, it, it, instead of me, there will be a dog speaking uh, or a cat speaking or another, another pet. Um, the, the reason for that, because uh, you don't have that deep of uncanny valley for uh, the fictional characters rather than for humans. For sure. You, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm speaking much more uh, from... Uh, from a place of personal experience, because at Synthesia, our work is really about synthesizing a human performance and, and really nailing that down. Um, I think my answer to your question is you can already do that using uh, using filters and using facial mapping. And so I, I do think that there is there is is going to be that use case as far as uh, generating video and 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 reskinning it. That's something that we can certainly already do. I think that the piece that's missing there is where does that input and information come from? Mm -hmm. uh, again, and, and it goes back to the AI models with natural language processing, where again, can we communicate with information and can it generate something that matches the response and what you're expecting? Because then the animation, the, 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 the technology already exists to, to, to do that. Great. Kevin. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. I'm super excited about the future of digital avatars. I think they'll be with us for forever from now on, and they will be getting better and better um, every time. Um, yeah, and this is all to say, you know, I've made a, as each new version of the tech has come out, I've made a version of myself. Uh -huh. uh, when, you know, for each year that goes by. So those avatars will live on forever and ever as well. So yeah, uh, I, I need to subscribe and build my own avatar. It's it's about time. Uh, about time. So, Come on through. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get on board. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome, Elliot. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye bye.